please turn to Exodus chapter 20. We are in the Ten Commandments series, and I want to do a quick review because it has been a few weeks as we've been looking at the law of the Old Testament, and in particular, the, the first Ten Commandments. We've seen together that 68% of the first five books of the Old Testament are law, the laws, and um, not many people like law. Law is often considered kind of cold and arrogant and harsh. And if you break down the 613 laws, there are 365 that are negative. You shall not do this. And then there are 248 that are positive. You should do this. And today, we come to a positive command, one of the you shoulds. And so that'll be a good thing because we've looked at a lot of negative ones so far. Now, how do you understand the law? If you don't get it, uh, again, it's kind of cold, it's kind of harsh, it's kind of arrogant. Well, Christians have broken the law in the Bible into three categories, and it's very helpful to understand how we get a, a proper view of the first five books of the Old Testament. So Christians look at the law this way. We say there are some laws that are ceremonial in nature, meaning... They have to do with prophets and priests and feasts and sacrifices and cleanliness and the kind of food you eat. They're ceremonial. And then secondly, there are some laws that are civil. They have to do with crops, the way you grow your food. And they have to do with kings, uh, the way that the land should be ruled. And they have to do with criminals, the way crime should be punished. And then thirdly, there are moral laws. So you have ceremonial, you have civil but then you have moral laws. Moral laws simply reflect who God is. They are laws that tell us the nature of the God who created us, who has made us, and who loves us. And so when we read the Old Testament and we look at those laws, people often get quite overwhelmed. And the reason why is we don't have a, a good sight of exactly how these categories work out. Jesus said in the New Testament in Matthew 5 these words. He said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, meaning I didn't come to get rid of the law or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it, to fulfill the law or complete the law. So, are we still under the ceremonial laws today? If we were, it would impact the kind of clothes we wear. It would impact where we worship. We'd have to take a plane to Jerusalem. It would impact a lot of things that are ceremonial in nature. And we believe that Jesus fulfilled or completed all of those ceremonial laws, meaning that he was the final priest, the great high priest. He put all other priests kind of on the unemployment block when he died on the cross. He didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. He was the final sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And so we're not under the ceremonial law. It's fulfilled in Jesus. What about the civil law? Well, we in the United States of America are not a theocracy. In other words, we do not have Jesus as the king or the president of the United States of America. And so when Jesus came, he kept the civil laws perfectly, and he is now ruling at the right hand of God as the king of kings and lord of lords, meaning this, that his people are not just ethnically Jews, but Jesus has a people that he's saving from all across the world. Like the children's song says, red, yellow, black, and white. In other words, it doesn't matter your skin color or your ethnicity. He is king of all peoples as he's saving them. So we're not under the civil laws anymore. They're fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus also fulfilled the moral laws. And the Ten Commandments we've been studying are moral laws. I believe all ten of them reflect the nature of who God is. And Jesus kept all of the law perfect. He never sinned in this world. Yet, we are still responsible for the moral laws. In other words, we're going to read these 17 verses in a minute, Exodus 21 through 17, and we still are very much responsible because these laws, while they're fulfilled in Jesus, we are held to keep them because they're not only written in the Bible. Romans tells us they're written on everyone's conscience, everyone's heart has these laws. People all across the world, some that have never seen a Bible, know it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to lie, it's wrong to kill. Why? Because he says he's written these laws on our consciences and we are very much accountable for them. So that was a long introduction. Where have we been? The first commandment, you should have no other gods before me, had to do with who we worship and idolatry. We worship the one true God. 
The second commandment was you should not make any graven images. So that was about how we worship, the external worship, not just what goes on inside, but what goes on outside. Last week, it was about how we speak about God. So we discuss not abusing or misusing God's name, summarized by the word blasphemy. Now today, it gets interesting, because today we get to a positive commandment. How we use our time. And I've entitled this, Rest Right and Work Well. That is exactly what God is going to say to us in verses 8 through 11. You see, God is to be served and honored daily, but He has called us to have one day in seven that is supposed to be a day that is called here in these verses a Sabbath a day of rest, of ceasing from our work, but also keeping it holy. And you need to understand, everything in the life of Israel orbited around this commandment. Some of you, most of you, if you're probably over the age of 30, you can identify with this. When you were a child in the United States of America, how many percentage of the stores were open on Sunday? Almost none, right? In fact, until the last 15 years, you couldn't go shop almost anywhere. Only emergency responders and emergency needs, gas stations and this such, were open on Sunday, right? But our culture has changed some as the blue laws have went away. And so now things are very different. So if you're under 30, you might not remember a day where everything was closed and Sunday was a day set apart. Now, most of us in the room, we would say, I will never commit adultery, or I will never try to just purposely steal from somebody else. But when it comes to the Sabbath and this law that we're going to look at today, we very conveniently skip over it, and we have no problem working right through the weekend. And some of us try to cram more work into the weekend than we did during the week. And so as we look at this today, we're going to see that God commands us to take a Sabbath. That this is a moral law that reflects who he is, and he's not asking us to do something that he himself hasn't done. In fact, it is a day to rest your body, to recharge your emotions, to renew your spirit by focusing on God. And this is commandment number four. It's actually before killing and stealing and adultery and some of those other ones. So we probably should pay attention to what God says here. How we use our time. I always uh, think these have been really hard sermons, the first three, and um, I'm surprised most of you even showed up today after how much you were offended the first three in the series. And uh, hopefully you have some steel-toed boots on, so I'll start off by offending um, just a special group in the church, uh, Blonde Baptists. So I heard a story about, thanks for laughing, at least I got a laugh in the beginning of the joke, um, a Blonde Baptist who was going around and she found someone and, and asked, hey, do you know what time it is? And the response was, well, it's 4.45. And the blonde, with a real puzzled look on her face, replied, it's so weird, I just don't understand. I've been asking this question all day, and I keep getting a different answer every time. And, you know, I just don't understand. <laughs> you know, time, for most of us, is not something we think about in terms of how we use it, right? Sorry to the blondes in the room. But time should be a precious thing to each one of us. As a pastor, I have to think about time all the time. Why? Because we have to fit in as a pastor visitation, helping people that are sick, counseling, whether it's marriage or premarital or personal counseling, uh, health counseling. I have to try to fit in administration. I have to fit in study time, leadership meetings, um, the administration of the church as a whole, the business end of it. I have to also fit in this, this group called my family, right? And I have to spend time with them and love them and actually put them in front of the church. Some of you probably find that hard to believe. But that's true. That's what the Bible calls all of us to. And then on top of that, uh, there's this thing called recreation that we're supposed to fit into our lives. And as a pastor, that's hard sometimes to find that downtime. And I want to say to you that time is a precious thing to me. It's very precious. And as I was thinking through the sermon, bottom line, most of us, whether you're a pastor or whatever your occupation is in the room, we seem to always have the same problem. We have a frustration of always feeling rushed, not having enough time to get everything accomplished, right? And we often make complaints like, if I only had one extra day this week, I could have got it all done. Who said that, right? We, we often say things like, 
if I could really use a vacation. Who wants a vacation right now? I could really use some time off. If I only had another day during the week, then I would read the Bible, then I would pray, then I would study the Scriptures. You see, human beings can't work seven days, week in and week out, without serious mental and physical exhaustion. We call that burnout, don't we? We must have a day off. We must have rest. And God, in His great mercy, has provided a remedy to help those of you who struggle with time management, who are burnt out this morning. One day of rest in seven, but it's not just rest, it's rest in Him. It's rest in His grace. So join me. Let's read together God's Word, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, and then we'll pray and we'll ask for His help. The Scripture says, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God." visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Here's our text today. The longest command, by the way, of the ten. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The rest of the commands, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbors, the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me in prayer, please. Father, we bow before you now, and I ask that you would still our hearts. There's a lot here today. There's a lot in these verses that we need to consider, and I pray you would help us to hear your voice and know how to rest right and how to work well. I pray, God, that you would work in our hearts today, that for those who are burnt out, that they would be refreshed today. And you, Jesus, for those of us here in this room who are not working well, I pray, O oh God, that you would renew them and you would get them on track and you would change them. Help us, Father. We need you, Jesus. We need your righteousness and your goodness. Can't do this on our own. So I pray now for your blessing on this time, on this Lord's day, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Why is this fourth commandment unique? The reason why I gave a big introduction like it is very long today as a reminder is because the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy is the only one that has moral, civil, and ceremonial aspects to the commandment. So the other nine are really straightforward. They're all moral commands. They're all repeated explicitly clearly in the New Testament. They're all explicitly clearly on the conscience universally of all mankind. I believe the, the Sabbath command is a moral command as well. But there are other laws throughout the Old Testament that implicate civil and ceremonial parts of this law. So as a nation, Israel was commanded to execute strict penalties for Sabbath breakers. That would be a civil part of the command. We're not under that today. So if you break the Sabbath, the government doesn't have a right to convict you of a crime, because we're not a, a literal theocracy, meaning God is not the president of the United States, right? 
Also, there are ceremonial aspects, aspects to the Sabbath. So uh, while we're called to have a day of rest, as we read here in this passage, there were many special Sabbaths of the Old Testament. And we are told in the New Testament that all of those Sabbath days pointed to Jesus. And they were completed in Jesus. So Colossians 2 says, don't let anyone judge you in questions of the Sabbath, a Sabbath. Why? Because these were shadows of what was coming, pointing to Jesus. So some of the Sabbath laws that we read about in the Old Testament, and we don't have time to go through them all today, they're fulfilled in Jesus. We're not under them. Today, we want to simply focus on the moral part of the Sabbath of what reflects who God is and what He has for us, what's best for us, His children. The Westminster Confession of Faith said, the Sabbath law, as given here in Exodus chapter 20, is a positive command. You should do this. It's a moral command. It's something that reflects who God is, and it's something He's put on all of our consciences. Even pagan religions have Sabbaths where they rest. And then thirdly, it is a perpetual commandment, meaning it is a command that we are called, all of us, if we want God's best to follow, just like if we want God's best, we want when people out murdering, right? Well, in the same way, if we want God's best, we need to follow these words. So the longest of the Ten Commandments in verse 8 begins, and it tells us what to do, what to do. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He says to remember probably for a few different reasons. Number one, four chapters back in Exodus chapter 16, Israel gets out of Egypt. They're not slaves anymore. And God begins to miraculously provide food. I love the fact that God loves his people. He provides for his people. And even as good Baptists, he provides good food for his people. And so he's providing them manna in the wilderness. Where do you get food in the wilderness? Well, God will provide all your needs. And as he's providing them food, in Exodus chapter 16, we are told there, God said to the people that you're to gather the food morning by morning that he would give them, but on the Sabbath, it would be a day of solemn rest in which they would bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil on the previous day, and all that is left over lay aside till the morning. In other words, you're not supposed to go out and collect the food like you did the other six days. The seventh day is supposed to be different. So before he even gave the Ten Commandments, there was a Sabbath law for the people. But I think that the Sabbath, even when he says remember, goes farther back than that. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2, when God created the world. Remember, moral laws reflect who God is. It's what God's all about. And he wouldn't ask us to do something that he doesn't do himself. When God made the world in Genesis chapter 2, it says there, the heavens and the earth were finished. He had completed his work. And on the seventh day, God finished all that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So when he says remember, he's saying remember back to Exodus 16, But also remember back to the beginning when God was the creator. God took the seventh day, he rested on it, and he blessed it. Now, I don't know about you, but anything that God blesses is a good thing, right? Kind of interesting. The first thing God chose to bless was the Sabbath. That was the first thing we read about in the Bible. And anytime he blesses something, it's a good thing. If he blesses you, it's always going to be a good thing. And here he blesses this day. Now, why does he do this? Well, I think there's a couple reasons why that I want to give you to help you remember before we get into the heart of this command. Number one, he designed the Sabbath as a memorial day for us. We have a memorial day holiday, don't we, in this country where we remember the past and those who gave and served. And here he wants us to remember the creation of the world and in particular its creator. He wants us to remember that this world is not ours, it's his. He gave it to us to steward, to use. So we need to pause on this day and remember that the world's bigger than us. You know what? If you're constantly looking at the trees and you never look at the forest, you'll never have inspiration, will you? If you box yourself in in life, you'll never see 
what the possibilities are that God has for you. And in particular, if you never pause to remember who made you and who's pursuing you as the creator and Lord of this world, you'll never have the peace God's called you to have in your life. Secondly, remember the Sabbath. God sets it apart and blesses it and wants us, his people, to follow him on it and worship him on it so we distinguish ourselves from others. Because other religions and other peoples worship gods that they themselves made. They created their own gods. In Christianity, God created us. Big difference, right? Remember that God's the creator, and we worship a God who made us. We don't worship a God that we made. Number three, I believe that God has given us an example here. Why did he rest on the sixth day? He is giving us an example that we should work six days, but our bodies need a seventh day of rest. That this is not just a ceremonial or a civil law, but it's a moral law. It reflects who God is in his very being. Could God have made the world in one day? Yeah. Could he have made it in four days? Could he have made it in six days? Yeah, he did. Uh, some people have a hard time believing that, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches. The God who spoke this world into existence chose to do it in a particular way. Six days. Why? Well, I believe he did this because he was setting up the pattern for our lives and for perpetual generations' lives. In other words, he here, the fact that God works six days is showing us there's dignity in our work. It's not beneath us to work. It's not a bad thing to work. There's actually something that we can find joy in and respect in and dignity in as people. He's made us for this. Now, God did not rest on the seventh day, we must say, because he was weary, because he was fatigued, and because he needed ease and refreshment, and he was tired out. The prophet Isaiah says, Have you not heard, have you not known that the Lord, the creator of the, he the heavens and the earth, he does not grow faint or weary? Instead, he gives power to the faint, and to the one who's weak and has no might, he will increase their strength. The Bible says our God never slumbers nor sleeps. So the idea is not that God got tired and needed to lay down for a day, okay? The idea is he loves us and he was setting a pattern for us to help us to function the way we are supposed to. In fact, I'll prove that to you this way. On the seventh day, when God instituted the Sabbath and he rested, God did not stop working. He only stopped creating. Think about it this way. We call these works that he kept doing his works of providence. So on the seventh day, the Bible clearly says that God never took a break from the laws of nature. So nature doesn't have a holiday, does it? In other words, if you cut yourself on the seventh day, does your skin still begin to heal and clot on that day? Why does it do that? Because God's designed you that way. Does it ever rain on the seventh day? Yes. Does it ever on the seventh day? Does God ever stop providing for the needs of his creatures? No. Does fruit continue to grow on the seventh day? Does God continue to preserve and sustain our lives on the seventh day? If God were to rest in the sense of totally stop working and stop his providential work, the entire universe would fold up in an instant. In other words, God is constantly at work, work upholding all things by his power. However, in his creative work, he stopped because he loves us and he cares about us. In fact, Israel was commanded to still do certain things on the Sabbath day. They were still supposed to circumcise their children on the Sabbath day. They were still supposed to bring their sacrifices to the temple and the tabernacle for worship on the seventh day. They were supposed to have a special day, though, on the Sabbath. So let's break down exactly how does this apply to you and me. Remember the Sabbath. What does that mean? Well, the word Sabbath in Hebrew is just like it says in English, Shabbat. It means to rest or to cease to stop your labor. It is a day that is not business as usual. It is a day that is supposed to stand out from the other six. It is a day, you notice here, that is supposed to be kept holy. Holy. I want to let you 
Baptist friends know, and those of you who are not Baptists to know, that it does not say remember the Sabbath day to keep it lazy. Some of you are experts at that. You got the first part down. You've got the Sabbath day, but it's a day of lazy. That's not what the Bible says here. Some of us believe in Sunday fun day, right? Now, it does not say you can't have fun on Sunday. I don't want to get you wrong. I'm not going to uh, take the, the pulpit and be Lloyd Legalist this morning. What it does say, though, is that it's supposed to be holy in whatever you do. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Holy means set apart, different, dedicated to God. When John Calvin wrote on this passage many years ago, he said, God does not delight in us being idle or being lazy and slothful. And there is no importance if we just cease from our labors of our hands and feet. It would be childish superstition to just rest without any other idea except for being in the service of God. In other words, what Calvin's getting at is this. He's saying that we have two parts to ourselves, don't we? We have a body. Does the body need rest? Yes. If you don't come apart and rest, you're just going to come apart eventually, right? You're going to burn out. But we also have another part of us called the soul. That's what's inside of us. That's who we really are. That's our identity. And our soul also needs rest, but it needs rest in the one who made us and created us. So the point of Sabbath is not just for us to be lazy, it's for us to find holiness on that day. To not just rest our bodies, but to rest our innermost being. Because that needs to be recharged just as much as the rest of us. Now the reason why he says to remember the Sabbath is because we are very quick to fall into indifference about the things of God. You miss church one Sunday, you might miss it six in a row, right? Very easy to do that, get out of the habit. You stop praying one day, you might not pray for four days straight. You stop reading the Bible, you might forget where you put it. It's pretty easy to do that, right? I mean, let's be honest. And so, when he says, remember, he knows how easy we can get distracted. And this is God's reminder, his memorandum to his people that, hey, on the seventh day, I'm still here. I still love you. I still created you, and I still want to do something in you. I want you to think of it this way. Remembering the Sabbath is kind of like remembering your anniversary. For those of you that are married in the room, you know that's an important day, right? And it's not enough for you guys to say to your wife, oh, I remember our anniversary. I feel like it was just yesterday. It's not enough just to say I remember it. It's a good idea if you have an anniversary to have some quality time with the one you love, isn't it? Maybe dinner. Maybe flowers. Yes, wives, elbow him if he's not doing it. He deserves it. All right? Remembering is more than just saying happy anniversary, is it not? Remembering in the biblical context is investing and loving. It doesn't have to be money, but it has to be quality, doesn't it? it look, ladies, is it not true that the thing you would want much more than expensive jewelry is quality, time? Amen? Amen? Thank you. Guys, listen to that. Now all of us listen to this. What does God want from us? Quality time with Him. Holiness is not about length. It's about quality. And so, to keep something holy is to have it be quality, set apart. In fact, Leviticus says the Sabbath is to be a holy convocation when we come together and we remember. And you say, well, pastor, um, this is sounding like it's, it's just too strict for me. Well, look, our Lord Jesus always worshipped on the Sabbath day. You read it throughout all the Gospels. If Jesus did it, I think it's a good idea for you and me, right? The focus on worship of holiness on this day of rest Led to, the Pur led to the Puritans calling the Sabbath the market day of the soul. Let me, let me explain that idea to you. The market day of the soul. Six other days is the market day of the body, where we're working. We're working hard. We devote ourselves to transactions in life. But the seventh day is for our spiritual business, where we deal in the currency of heaven, and we are encouraged in here. Some of us are so worn down 
not because we don't rest with our bodies. Some of you are very good at resting your bodies, but you're run down because you've never rested the inside person. You've never taken time for the person that will last forever, the soul. Thomas Watson said, God made this day on purpose to raise our hearts to heaven, to converse with Him, to do the work of the angels, to be employed in earthly work. On the Sabbath is to degrade the soul of its honor. Look, God loves you, and He wants not just your money or your, your body. He wants you. He cares about the things that no one else sees. Some of you in this room, no one knows what you're going through. What you're feeling on the inside, but God does. And the Sabbath is all about connecting that to Him. The Geneva Bible said, This is a spiritual rest by hearing God's Word and resting from our worldly labors. Some of you, you come to church every Sunday, but the only spiritual rest you get is when you sleep while the pastor's preaching. So wake up. I should just do this more often, right? That'll scare you. I love it when I you know, get excited and do that and someone jumps out of their seat. It's great. Drool flies, you know, to the front row. In holy thoughts, words, works, worship, the Sabbath is a day where the Lord God does something inside of us, where He works in us and changes us. When I worship God, I'm not just horiz uh, horizontal, I'm vertical. My mind and my heart goes places that it doesn't go sometimes Monday through Saturday. And in fact, difficult things become easy. The impossible becomes simple when I connect to God on the inside. Billionaire Bill Gates was un once asked why he didn't believe in God. Why don't you believe in God, Bill? Well, he said, quote, just in terms of allocation of time resources, religion is not very efficient. There's a lot more I could be doing on a Sunday morning, unquote. Let me tell you something, friends. We need to take care not just of our bodies, but our inner person, our soul. And let me tell you, there's going to come a day where this body is going to be in the ground and the soul will last forever, right? Amen. Have we taken care of what lasts forever? Now, God blesses this day, honors this day, sets it apart, but so many of us profane it and we dishonor it. And I want to warn you today as we come to the next verse, verse 9. Some of us, we worship, we worship every week, but what we worship is our work. You see, we sacrifice to our God of work every week. We sacrifice our family, we sacrifice our children, our spouse, and our relationship with God and His church. The first commandment was what? You shall have no other gods before me. Well, your God is not a graven image on a shelf. Your God is your work. Productivity has become your idol. I want to tell you something. I'm just going to confess to you. One of my biggest struggles is the idol of productivity. In fact, uh, my wife and I talk about this all the time. We both struggle with this. Always producing and producing and producing and not allowing enough of it coming back to invest inside of us. We struggle with this. Can I be honest with you and say that? And some of us here, we make work a god. We battle against this. You know, New York City used to be known as the city that never sleeps. And now it seems much of the country never sleeps, right? Just constantly going and working. But he reminds us here, we should work and work well, but we should not only work. Look at verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Emphasis, six days. In other words, if you don't come apart and rest at some point, you're going to simply come apart, fall apart. Verse 8 told us what to do. Verses 9 and 10 specify how we're to do it. How we're to do it. Now, this part of the fourth commandment is often overlooked, isn't it? Because we live in a lazy world. So we, we emphasize worship God, but we don't emphasize six days you should work. Now, it doesn't say you have to work the entire day six days. But what it says here very clearly is that God governs our rest in the first verse. God governs our work in verse 9. If you idle away your time on the six days, you're just as guilty as the guy who does not rest on the seventh day. It's like uh, the lazy Baptist worker. Do you know why he put his clock under the desk that he worked at? He wanted to tell everyone he worked overtime. Bad joke. For some of you, that's about the only overtime you ever worked though, right? Some of you in this room, you are up at the crack of noon and you take two naps a day. 
This part of the message is for you. God governs our work. He's called us to be a people that are active. If you waste your time away during the week, you are dishonoring God just as much as the person who wastes his soul away. You see, Christians should be hard workers. We should be diligent workers. Companies should want to hire Christians because we have a work ethic that's different than everyone else's because we know that God governs our work just as much as he governs our rest. You see, six days are appointed for labor here. The Lord's Day begins with working hard the rest of the week. This is real practical, by the way. You want to know why Pensacola is a city has struggled? I've sat in on many meetings, meetings with county leaders, city leaders. I have heard this from many different experts. The reason why Pensacola struggles and why our city has a hard time getting businesses to bring jobs here is twofold. Number one, we have a poorly educated workforce. That's it. People can't read well. That's a, that's a sad thing, and it's hard. We need to invest in that. We need to care about that. But number two, you know what it is? We have a poor workforce. Businesses don't want to come to a place where people don't work hard. If you can't find good employees, why would you bring your business there? They'll go to a city where people work hard and have a hard work ethic. And that's a real shame in a city that has as many churches as ours does, isn't it? Shouldn't be that way. Because a lot of us, we talk about our Sundays, but what about Monday through Saturday? What kind of a worker are you? Look at verse 9 again. Six days you should labor. This is contrasted with the past of the Israelites. Do you realize that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, it was a wonderful, refreshing thing? Because the Israelites had been slaves for 400 years. They had taskmasters that were watching them. And if they ever stopped to take a break, their overseers were always present with a whip to put them back into work mode. Day after endless day, they exhausted their bodies, crying out for relief and not getting any relief. They worked seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and they never got a vacation. Never. And all of a sudden, God rescues them from this. And he says, you can have a day of rest. It doesn't have to be that way. Value your soul and your body. I value both. In Deuteronomy 5.15, the Bible says there, You shall remember you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. God has given us as a remedy for overworking one day out of seven to rest in His grace. He has given us a rhythm of work and rest. Work and rest. And we are supposed to use our heads and our hands to work, but we are also supposed to use our hearts when we rest. To love God is not to have a lazy day one day a week. It is rather to have a busy week and then a day resting in Him, worshiping Him. Now, there's some lawyers in the room. I don't mean like criminal or defense attorneys. I mean spiritual lawyers. And you're always looking for loopholes to get around God. And you're always, some of you are the very opposite of the loophole lawyers. Some of you are the, uh, the critical lawyers, and you're always wanting to come down on others to make yourself look better, right? And so I want you to understand here that the Bible does have ceremonial and civil laws about the Sabbath, but we're not under those. But there is a moral law part that we are very much under. And I want you to know that one of the things Jesus spoke about and spoke against was people that were legalistic in terms of the Sabbath, meaning they tried to emphasize only civil and ceremonial, and they forgot the moral. So in Jesus' day, here's some of the laws the rabbis had came up with. And Jesus, he not only broke these superstitious rules on the Sabbath, he taught against them and said, the Sabbath was made for man, right? Or, and and uh, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. I complete the Sabbath. Here's some of the things the rabbis taught that were not in the Bible. They said on the Sabbath, a man could not carry something in his right hand or in his left hand, across his chest or on his shoulder, but he could carry something with the back of his hand, his foot, his elbow, or in his, hear, his ear, his hair, or in the hem of his shirt, or in his shoe or his sandal. You got way too much time to come up with a law like that, right? <laughs> on the Sabbath, 
Israelites were forbidden to tie a knot, except a woman could tie a knot in her girdle. So if a bucket of water was to be raised from a well, an Israelite could not tie a rope to the bucket, but a woman could tie her girdle to the bucket and pull it up from the well. (laughs) It's amazing how the guys, the rabbis, who were all men, worked that out for the women, isn't it? (laughs) Tailors were not allowed to carry a needle with them on the Sabbath for fear they might be tempted to perform work. Chairs could not be moved for fear of making a groove into the ground. Baths could not be taken for fear some of the water might spill onto the floor and wash it. That's stupid, right? Some of the the Sabbath laws were crazy. You'll like this one, ladies. Women were not allowed to look in the mirror lest she see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out on the Sabbath. This is a rough one for some of you. False teeth could not be worn because they exceeded the weight limit for burdens on the Sabbath, so you couldn't wear your dentures. Now, seriously, this caused a lot of pain for Israel. Their legalism led to the Romans coming against them. And when the Jews were were hiding in the caves, fighting against the Roman army, we are told that Pompey, what he did was that he realized the Jews wouldn't fight back on the Sabbath. And so they're up high in the caves. So he started building these uh, mounds that would... Uh, these siege mounds that would work their way up to the caves, but he would only have his troops build them on the Sabbath day. Jews wouldn't shoot at them on the Sabbath day. Eventually, they got close enough where they were able to defeat and literally slaughter all the Jewish people because of these, these legalistic stipulations that had nothing to do with the Sabbath. In fact, even in Israel today, uh, when my wife and I were in Israel, Orthodox Jews, they don't use electricity. They use candles when they light up their house. They don't use their overhead lights. Orthodox Jews prep their food the day before they eat. They won't travel a long distance. They will not open the refrigerator if they forget to take the light bulb out the day before because if the light bulb were to come on, that would be the use of electricity. In fact, one of the funny things um, in the hotels that we were at on the Sabbath day, there were two elevators. And I didn't realize this until the Sabbath. And uh, one elevator is a Sabbath elevator. And one is the, the weekday elevator. And what's kind of interesting is the Sabbath elevator, it goes up each floor on its own automatically. The other one, it's like a normal American elevator. You push the button, it goes up. And the reason why we figured this out is on the Sabbath day, uh, there was a long line at the Sabbath elevator because everyone was observant and wanted to use the Sabbath elevator. And so we walked over. We're, you know, we're already going to hell because uh, uh, we're Gentiles. So we use the, the weekday elevator. Why not? You're not allowed to not use it. It's just if you're an observant Jew, you use the other. It was kind of interesting is when we walked inside of the um, the uh, regular elevator, all of a sudden, tons of the Jewish people from the Sabbath elevator line ran into our elevator, just as quick as could be. Can you point number, hit number four for us and number eight for us? I mean, we're already going to hell and we eat ham, so they might as well damn us a little more, right? <laughs> but they wouldn't touch the buttons themselves because they would be working on the Sabbath. In fact, we walked down the street one day, you couldn't get a cab in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And we actually had a, a crazy guy screaming and hollering at us. My Hebrew wasn't good back then, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't very nice what he said because we were walking too far on the Sabbath. Now, there's some of you in the room that are like that. You're very legalistic and you're missing the point. So look at verse 10 because verse 10 and 11 get to the heart of this as we close. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. In other words, this is not to be a burden. This is to be a blessing, a release from hard labor. You must have rest. You must rest in Christ. You must have a day off. We know doctors tell us that serious mental and physical Conditions come from exhaustion, from overworking. Medical experts say that major illnesses from depression to allergies, heart disease, migraines, immunological diseases come from overworking. But when we rest in Christ mentally, emotionally, and physically, we are healthier and we are better. When we shift our minds and hearts from the attention and demands of the world to the souls and the glories of heaven, God does something to heal us and work inside of us. In fact, one preacher said we should always try (coughs) to depart daily 
have a little time of rest in God daily. That's our Bible study, our prayer. We should withdraw weekly, have a Sabbath, and we should try to abandon annually to have that vacation time to rest in Christ and have fun and enjoyment. Now, I know immediately you're going to read verse 10, and, and some of you are going to say from the, the hard work spectrum, you're going to say, that'll never work in 2015. I've got to work seven days a week. A week. It's not that I want to have the God. I have no choice. I'm one of those hard heads that thinks that way sometimes. Well, I want to prove to you that that's not true. Some, some business owners say, I've got to be open seven days a week. I've got to compete with the other companies. Have you ever heard of a restaurant called Chick-fil-A? You ever heard of that? They got the best chicken and they're closed every Sunday. Why? Kathy Truitt, the founder, was a Christian. And he believed in a Sabbath, the day of rest for his people. So not only do they have waffle fries and good chicken, but they have happy employees. And by the way, they, they get more money in in six days of work than most businesses ever will get in seven. Because they honor God. It works. The principle works. This verse tells us who should observe the Sabbath. Husbands and wives, the leaders of the home, you should observe the, have, the Sabbath first off. You need to be the leaders for everyone underneath you in the home. Like Joshua said in chapter 24, you choose who this day he will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to put God first. Look, every day we have 24 hours, six days a week. Why can't we put God first on Sunday every week? Do you know how many hours you have? If you only work 40 to 50 hours a week, you have so many hours that you waste a week doing other things. And you mean you're too busy to put God first every week on His day, the Lord's day? This is His principle. It starts with the leadership of the home. Then it even goes to the children. You're responsible for your kids and parents. I say to you, God will hold you accountable because the way you train them now will result in the way they honor God later. He will hold you accountable. What do you put first? Look, you can do anything else during the week, but shouldn't you worship with your, fa your real family, your spiritual family, and put your heart on Christ when it matters most, the day that He's commanded you to it? Then it says, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, meaning that those who work, our workers, have the same rights under God as those who are the bosses. Employer and employee are one under God. We both deserve rest. In other words, employers have a responsibility to care for their workers and their employees. I'm thankful for Kathy Truitt and the example he set, and other Christians who set that example in their businesses. Some scholars have described this fourth commandment as the world's first workers' bill of rights. Because this is a radical concept in the ancient world, that those who work for you should rest, just like you get to rest. A new social order. And then, for those of you who love animals, God cares about them too, not even your cattle. Your cattle should rest as well. Yeah, God cares about animals. Does He care about animals to the same extent as those who have eternal souls? No, there's a different way that God cares about animals, but He cares about them, and we should too. And we should not abuse or misuse animals either. The cattle did not rest. The servants probably would not rest. So let them rest as well. And then even the stranger in your gate. This isn't like kids don't talk to strangers. These are the guests that are in your town or in your home, in your city. Why? Why? Verses 8, verse 8 told us what to do. 9 to 10, how we're to do it. 11 explains why. For in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord God blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Very important here. God blessed this thing. He said, this is for you. It's good for you. It's a day of rest. It's for your soul. It's for your body. It's because I love you and I care about you and I want you to be well. And I want you to serve me at your best. The Sabbath is not to be a straitjacket for the Christian. What it is, is it's a day where the businessman rests from business, where a housewife rests from housework, where a student rests from his studies. And whatever God's called you to do, you rest from what you normally do the first six days of the week, and you commit that day to the Lord and what He has for you. People often ask questions like, can I watch TV on Sunday? Can I play Frisbee on Sunday? Can I go to a restaurant on Sunday? Can I play games on Sunday? Or do I only have to play Bible trivia all day? 
When we start asking these kind of questions, what we're really saying is, what can I get away with, right? That's not the spirit of the Sabbath. It's to rest in Christ. For some of you, because you're business people, you need to start your Sabbath off every week. And by the way, I really believe that no matter where we are, we should always set that day as a day to worship God. First and foremost, if you can't give God a couple hours in the beginning of the week, how in the world do you expect Him to bless the rest of it? It's not that hard. It's not a big... Look, some people are like, oh, it's such a sacrifice to go to Sunday. No, your priorities are a mess. They are a mess. It is not a straight jacket, but we do need to spend time with God. And then, can I take a walk on Sunday? Well, yeah, I think you can. God wants you to enjoy His creation. Can we have fun as a family on Sunday? Yes, but are you resting in Christ is the question. Are you doing it with Christ with you, beside you, in front of you, behind you? Is Jesus Lord of that day of your life? Resting in Him, enjoying family, enjoying serving Him. In fact, Jesus said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It was a day for mercy. Most of His miracles He did on the Sabbath. He did good things on the Sabbath. It's a day to welcome the stranger and feed the poor and visit the sick, as well as recharge His families. And it looks different from all of us, but it should always start the same way in worship to God as a church family. Is there room for Christian freedom? Yes, there is. But bottom line, like a car needs regular maintenance, regular maintenance we, or it will not wear well. We need regular rest, and we need it for our bodies and for our souls. Look, God rested on the seventh day from his work of creation. And here's how we end. The reason why God did that is to teach us we can rest from our works. Your works aren't going to save you. Some of you think if you do more, God will be happy with you. If you just try harder, you work harder, if you just give more money, if you just spend more time at the church, if you just uh, are more of a philanthropist with your business, God is going to be happy with you. The Bible says we are saved not by works of righteousness, which we have done. The Bible says it's by grace you're saved, not through faith. It's a gift of God. It's not of your works, lest you should boast. It's a day where we rest and we say, God, my works... This week, they were not good enough. So that's why we're gathering together to remember Jesus' work. When Jesus died on the cross, he did all the work to save us. He said, it is finished. He completed the work so we could be saved and changed. We no longer look back to the old exodus for our salvation. We look to Jesus who accomplished a greater exodus by dying for our sins and rising again. And he made Sunday his day, the Lord's day, where the early church always gathered together, always worshipped, always gave on. In fact, John, even at the end of the book of Reve in the beginning of the book of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, it was on the Lord's day he was in the spirit in worship. We are called to this. And under law, we work towards God's rest, but after Jesus finished his work on the cross, we enter into his rest. Hebrews 4.9 says, There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God who have entered God's rest and rested from his works as God did from his. Jesus rose again on Sunday, and now we rest in what he has done to save us and change us. I heard of Dr. Robert Rayburn once telling a story of a man who was approached by a beggar on the street. The man was just seeking some money. Dr. Rayburn tells that the man reached into his pocket, he saw what money he had, and he found $7 in his pocket. So he flipped through it, and feeling sorry for the man, he started to give the man one, two, three, four, five, six. But he was going to hold on to the seventh dollar because he needed it for something. And this man, this beggar, greedily took his hand and snatched the dollar out of his hand, accidentally struck this man who was showing grace to the beggar, struck him in the face, took the money, and ran, grabbed the seventh dollar too. When you hear a story like that, what do you think of the, Gregor, the beggar? Ungrateful? Unthankful? Arrogant? Well, then what do you think of a sinner saved by the grace of Jesus Christ who insists on taking seven days a week for himself? It's the same scandal. We need to rest in God. We need to trust in God, and we need the blessing of God. And some of you today... Look, Jesus has done all the work. He loves you, and he wants you to stop trying so hard and to rest in him. He says, if you call upon me, I will save you. Whoever believes in him will not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Let's bow before the Lord in prayer. Friend, this is Joshua Walnofer, pastor of Klondike Baptist. And I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today. If we can be of any help to you, answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.